Amen, indeed. My goodness. Good morning, Chapel Hill. It is a blessing to be together today. I want to welcome those of you who have gathered in person. I want to welcome those of you who have gathered with us online. This is the day that the Lord has made. Now, you might notice that our senior pastor, Jeff Gannon, is not here today. He and Meredith are in Lawrence celebrating the joy of their daughter Grace's graduation from KU with her bachelor's. So we celebrate with them and wish Grace all the success. At this time, if you're able, would you stand with me and join in our greeting as found on the screens? This is the good news which we proclaim to you. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Walk in the light of his love. Live in the light of his teachings and healing mercies. Come, let us worship the one who overcame death. Let us celebrate the triumph of our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, Chapel Hill. It's great to be with you this morning. It's great to be in the presence of a God whose love and grace is big enough for each and every one of us, no matter where we are or where we've been. But we know that we need God's love this morning, so let's lift up our voices together and sing, Oh, how I need you. us to wait on your presence, God, 
so that we might experience the transformation of your love. In Jesus' name. Oh, restless heart, do not grow weary. Hold on to faith and wait. The God of love will not tarry. No, God is never late. So I wait in the promise. I wait in the hope. from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the do doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. 
Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So uh, Reverend Jen referred to Jeff as the senior pastor, but I'm two years older than Jeff. I was ordained a year before him. I think I'm the most senior pastor. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I'm sure some of you have had that wonderful moment when you're at some place of business and the person behind the counter says and sir would you like the senior discount then you have the mixed emotions because your first thought is oh I look so old you're already asking me for that but second how much is the discount because I am I am interested (laughs) well today I want to talk about doubt oddly enough I want to talk about the benefits of doubt. 
Doubt gets a pretty bad rap in many Christian circles. And I want to challenge that, and hopefully by the end of the sermon, you'll think, hmm, I have a different view of what doubt is all about. That rhymed. So, the um, most reverend, Justin Welby, most reverend, because he's the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, if you don't know, he would be kind of the Pope of the Anglicans, head guy, top guy. And he said this in an interview, at times I wonder if God is really there. And boy, did that create a firestorm. Suddenly, in the London Times, the headlines read, even God's earthly emissary isn't sure if the whole thing's made up. Okay, that's a bit of a leap to go there. But it was as if they wanted to say, oh, look, he has doubts. The top guy has doubts. And then, of course, on the Twitter sphere, where really good theology happens, the atheist Peter Fitzsimmons said, victory, as if to prove that somehow it's all made up, this faith thing, because the top guy dared to say, sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wonder. In continuing with the Twitter sphere, another popular current theologian, I won't name them because I'm a nice guy, but this person said, because I'm going to attack what they said, <laughs> But this person said publicly, again, a person that people respect this, this guy's writings and so forth, but he said, doubt is slander against the Almighty. Jesus died to save you from doubt, not to make space for it, as if doubt were the enemy. Well, I would like to say, in the spirit of the British, I beg to differ. I beg to differ on this position. Because if you read the scriptures, it's pretty clear that the Bible does not shy away from doubt, from struggle. It's throughout the scriptures. The main characters, the people that are the heroes of our faith, were also people who, from time to time, doubted. Obviously, the book of Job. That's a, a, an, an extended treatise on trying to figure out where is God in the midst of suffering and questioning whether God was real, questioning whether God was good. Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, full of it. Ecclesiastes is full of this doubt, and even cynicism. And then Habakkuk, and then the Psalms, many of them written by one of our heroes of the faith, David. And the Psalms are full of questioning and searching. Where are you, God? Have you just cast me away? Are you there? Searching, questioning, doubting. The Bible doesn't shy away from it. And I love that about the Bible. It doesn't hesitate to address it. Philip Yancey, I've known Philip for a long time, one of my favorite writers, and he had this to say. He said, there's not a single argument against God from the older critics, that would be like Bertrand Russell, Voltaire, David Hume. Those were the guys who were writing centuries back, challenging faith. Or the newer ones, like Richard Dawkins or Hitchens or Harris, that aren't already included in the Psalms, Job, Habakkuk, and Lamentations. What's Philip saying? Their arguments against God, read these guys. From Hume to Dawkins, none of their arguments are new. They're right there in the Bible. And he says, I have respect for a God who not only gives us freedom to reject him, but also includes arguments against him in the Bible itself. God seems rather doubt tolerant, actually. Fun little turn of phrase there. Anybody doing any gardening and planting? This is the season to do that. I have the gift of killing things. I had a horticulturist, that's a fun title, who told me about certain plants that are drought tolerant. And I said to her, oh, I can kill it. I think I can. But a, but a plant that's drought tolerant means it can survive. But I love this. Philip saying, our God is a doubt tolerant. Our God is not afraid of our doubts. Doesn't look at our doubts and go, oh, how dare they doubt. That's not the kind of God that we have. So, we have the story today read by Beverly about Thomas. And we look at that story and we immediately give him a nickname. Doubting Thomas. That's how he is forever known. I want to rehabilitate his image today. 
You all know I really tried with Donkey Sunday. For three years I campaigned. Because on what we call Palm Sunday, there's one mention of palms. Donkeys are in all four Gospels, but we call it Palm Sunday. I tried and I failed to rehabilitate Palm Sunday. I'm afraid I'm going to fail today, but I want to try to see if we can look at Thomas from a different perspective. Because his doubt is not the central issue. So what's going on? So Thomas, he's one of the twelve. Here's the thing. Jesus appeared to the disciples. Tom didn't get the memo. He wasn't there. He missed that event. So that they went, Thomas, oh man, the Lord appeared. And he went, really? Because I, I didn't see him. You guys said it, but I didn't see it. You know what? I, I just, I need to touch it. I need to see him. I need to be, that's just what I need. And he says, I won't believe until I see it. So we look at the story and say, oh, he's Mr. Doubter, that Thomas. Is that what's really happening, though, in the story? I don't think so. Again, remember, Thomas wasn't present. Now think about this. When the women, the women were the first to see the risen Jesus, when they first went to the disciples, the disciples went, no, you're not telling the truth. I don't believe yet. They themselves didn't believe until they got to see him. They're not any better off than Thomas was. They are not people of faith at any more greater level than Tom. Because the resurrection was hard to believe. This wasn't like he was kind of sick and got better. He, was, he died, we say it in the creed, he died and he was buried. He was dead, dead, dead. People don't come back from that. So they had a reason to all of them doubt it. But what we see in the story, I believe, is not Thomas's doubt. He's not obstinate. He's like, I am never going to believe. What does he say? He says, I just need something. I need something in order to believe. In his case, he wanted to physically touch. So, I believe, looking at Thomas and thinking, he's just the doubt guy, is unfair. He wasn't all only doubt. He was saying, guys, I wasn't there. I just need to see something. And I think that's important. In the painting by Caravaggio, it's, this, it's the scene we're talking about where Jesus goes up to Thomas. And I love this painting for so many reasons, but, but one of them is that if you look at Jesus' hand, he actually takes Thomas's hand and puts it there the place where, he, where the spear went in. And what Caravaggio was trying to show, and I think you can see it, is it looks like a spear, doesn't it? Thomas's hand and Jesus' hand on top of it, it looks like a spear going in. But Thomas is looking intently in the picture, in the painting. He's looking right at it. And then what also is kind of interesting, and you can't see it too well on this because it's a little washed out on the screen, but Thomas's left hand, Thomas's left hand is holding his side. You know when you see somebody who's been hurt somewhere and you kind of feel it yourself? I think Thomas is going, ouch, that must have really, wow, Lord. He's clutching his own side. But the big thing I want to, want to show from this is Jesus' compassion. For the last two weeks, Jeff's been talking about Peter's restoration. That Peter, who, much worse than Thomas, Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. All Thomas did was just go, well, I, I just need to see something. But what Jeff has been preaching about is Jesus' compassion for Peter was such that he said, let's have breakfast on the beach. Come on, Pete, you and me. Let's work this out. Jesus was very compassionate to Peter. I think when I look at this picture, I see Jesus' compassion for Thomas. Not his anger towards him for his unbelief, but his kindness to say, I know what you need, Thomas. Here you go. You can touch. You can see. And that is the beginning of his full-on confession of faith because one New Testament scholar said this, what Thomas says next is the greatest confession of faith in the Bible. That's a big leap because what does Thomas say after he touches it? He says, my Lord and my God. Not just you did it, but 
my Lord and my God. He went from uncertainty to exaltation. And just like Thomas, I think Peter also gets a bad rap. Because when we think of Peter, we think, oh, Peter and his lack of faith. Remember when Jesus said, get out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat, and then he started sinking. But think about that story for a second, folks. He got out of the boat. Who among us would do that? And second, he walked on water for a few seconds. Put that on a resume. Walked on water for five seconds. That's impressive. But we look at Peter and go, oh, he lacked faith. In the same sense, we look at Thomas and go, oh, he was a doubter. No, Thomas was just like all of us. He just needed something. And I think we all need something. So I want to talk about the benefits of doubt. You know, the play on word we say, give someone the benefit of doubt. I want to talk about the benefits of doubt. And I think there are three, there are more, but three that I've experienced personally. The first is this, doubt allows you to make your faith truly yours. Doubt allows you to make your faith truly yours. So here's the backstory with Justin Welby, the archbishop. He and his wife had a child, and when she was seven months old, she was in a car, and there was a car accident, and she died. So Justin and his wife went through the loss of their child through an accident. Do you fault him for saying, sometimes I wonder? Because our stories are where our theology lives, in our experience, in the things we have gone through. That's where our theology becomes real. And doubt allows your faith to become truly yours. Many people in this congregation know my family's story. Megan and I, we had a daughter, Madeline, our second child, who was born with a chromosomal disorder. We didn't see that coming. Our son Jacob was four, he was healthy. It wasn't in our mind that this was what we would face, but we did. And that was a season of struggle for us. A challenging season, followed up by the death of one of my closest friends, Rich Mullins, in a car accident. Six months later, Madeline died at the age of two. Not too long after that, my mother died. She was this north star of my life. I went through a season of doubt a season of struggle. And I had, I had been God's guy. I was ordained. I, I'd written a book called Embracing the Love of God. I was out traveling across the country telling people God is love. And then that happened to me, to our family. It's not that everything that I wrote about God I didn't believe. It's just it needed to take root, and that's what happened. Oswald Chambers says this, Always think through what you have easily believed. Your position's not really yours until you make it yours through suffering and study. I could say God is good, God is love, but once I went through this season of suffering, that statement took on a whole new meaning. It became mine through suffering and study. People would look at our family and say, how do you still continue to believe, having gone through that? But we did, not without struggle, not without doubt, not without being mad at God sometimes, but that's okay. God is doubt tolerant. And you see that. And so it was a season for us to deepen that. In the second sense, similar to this, doubt helps faith take root. And this is what's interesting because you don't see it happening when it's happening. You don't know that it's happening. But one of my favorite poets, Christian Wyman, says this, doubt is painful, but its pain is active rather than passive. Far beneath uh, beneath it, no matter how severe the drought of doubt, faith, durable faith, is steadily taking root. That's what can happen. That's what doubt can do. You don't think it's happening to you, but when you're going through those seasons, deep down, somehow your faith is taking root. It's becoming stronger and more real, though at the moment you don't know it. You don't know it until you get to the other side. Because in the midst of it, all you can experience is the pain. That's all you know is the loss. You're just sort of, it's the center of everything. 
But when you continue to hang on, your faith is actually deepening. A third benefit of doubt. Doubt is actually a gift to make our faith deeper. That's similar to the second one, but here's what I want to say. And this comes from Pete Enns. I love, he's one of my favorite theologians. But Pete says, doubt is a gift of God to move us from trusting ourselves to trusting him. Doubt's a normal part of the spiritual life. Let me stress that. It's a normal part of the spiritual life. Passing through these times of doubt, not around them. See, we want to go around them. Passing through them leads to greater spiritual depth and intimacy with God. What's happening, though? It's, it's a movement. The first part of this quote is where I think we get the most from it. Doubt's a gift of God to move us from trusting ourselves to trusting in Him. That's what I had to learn in that process. Because here was a false narrative that I had. I had a false narrative that said, God only allows suffering for the wicked. Turns out I'm not the only person that holds that narrative. That narrative is almost as old as time. It goes back to the book of Job. Job is suffering. We know the preamble. We know Job didn't do anything wrong. But Job and his friends don't know it, and all they can say is, what did you do? And that continues on, continues up to the time of Jesus. His disciples would see a catastrophe, and they'd say, Lord, what did they do? Clearly, no, bad things only happen to bad people. And I had to let go of that narrative to move from trusting, because see, really what it is, it's trusting in myself. That's narcissism. That's somehow thinking I control the universe through my behavior. If I can just live right, do the right things, everything's going to be fine. That's actually narcissism and control. Doesn't feel like it, but it is. During the season of struggle for, for me personally, there was a time at which I couldn't pray. I just couldn't pray anymore. I didn't know what to do. So I called my mentor, Dallas Willard. I called him up on the phone. And fortunately, I got he and his wife. Sweet Jane, his wife, is wonderful. She picked up the phone. I said, I was just trying to reach Dallas. I just, and she could tell in my voice that I was hurting. And so she stayed on the line, and they, we talked together. And I said, I just can't pray in this season. I don't know what to do. And Dallas and Jane shared a story with me that I didn't know. I didn't know that they had lost twin boys who were stillborn. I didn't know it. Not that I needed to know it, not that they were obligated to tell me, but I didn't know it. But in that season that I was going through, they could say to me, Jim, it's not your fault. God is still good. They had a kind of faith that I couldn't feel at the time, but it was happening, it was deepening. It was something that was going on. And Dallas would remind me of what Jesus said. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus didn't say might. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. I know that's not a popular thing to say, but it's the truth. And we all walk through it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about our doubts. We don't want to talk about that because maybe we're not supposed to. Put on a happy face. In this world, you will have trouble. But what else did Jesus promise? I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And he never did. I never felt abandoned by God. I could question God. I could rail at God. I could doubt. But I never felt completely abandoned because that's what Jesus promised. And in the process, my doubts actually strengthened my confidence in him. I believe that when God seems most absent, God may be speaking most clearly. C.S. Lewis said that. He said, sometimes our own pain is a megaphone for God. There are times that we can really hear that we can't hear through any other season than through the doubt and the darkness to know that God is actually at work in a deeper way than we knew. I suspect many of you are familiar with the poem Footprints in the Sand by Carolyn Joyce Cardi. But if you're not, and even if you are, it's worth repeating because I think there's some real 
depth and wisdom in it. It goes like this. One night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last seat of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never, ever, during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. That was my experience. Looking back, I would think, oh, I felt abandoned. It was just me by myself. But it was God who was carrying me. But I didn't know it. I believe that there is so much that we can gain from our doubts. They're, they're not something we should be afraid of. In fact, I would say this. Faith actually requires doubt. Because doubt, uncertainty, lack of knowledge is necessary for faith. Through our questioning and searching, we can arrive at a faith which is actually ours and thus cannot be taken away. It's more real. It's more deep. It's more sustaining. We don't ask for it. We don't go looking for it. But when we've walked through it and experienced a deepening in our faith, we can be grateful for it because it makes it real and it gives us voice to help others who are walking through that same valley. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Gracious God, how amazing it is that you made space for us just as we are. That doubt is a sign of healthy faith. So God, give us the courage to ask the questions, to cry the tears, to express the anger, knowing that when we see just one set of footprints, you are carrying us. God, there are so many situations in our world today that that need your love, that need your arms to carry the people who are hurting. God, we pause to pray once again for the people of Ukraine, for all of those who are suffering the violence of war, the fear of the unknown, the uncertainty. God, we pray for peace. And we pray for all of those who continue to clean up and engage in, in rebuilding efforts in the wake of the tornadoes that came through. We pray that you would help us to know how to be a blessing. And for those within our congregation who are struggling with health or grief or loneliness, we pause to pray for them. And we name particularly Pastor Ben and Denise, Rosa Wilson, Sherry Wilson, Lucinda Pickle, Dick Norwood, Bill Herndon, Pam Sharp, John Haas, and Larry and Elna Van Dyke. 
as well as those that we carry within our own hearts. We pause to celebrate with all of our graduates as they, as they rejoice in this moment and they look toward the next phase of their journey. We pray your blessing on each one. God, as we turn now to the giving of our tithes and our offerings, we pray that you would receive all that we give, not just our money, but our time, our talents, our hearts, our lives. Use it all for your glory and your way. For we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Before our ushers come to receive the offering, I'm going to invite David and Chanel to come up and share with us some excitement that Chanel has coming. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Whoops. Uh. Now you can. So my name is David Nelson, and I have the joy of introducing Chanel Hawkins. She is a student at Friends, and uh, what year are you in at Friends? I am a senior. I have one semester left. And what are you studying? Music education and vocal music performance. So Chanel has been um, accepted into a program. Uh, it is a opera program, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a month in Italy. Uh, and so um, part of that program is we are trying to raise some funds to help her out with that journey. So uh, the last payment is due on June 1st, is that correct? So tell us a little bit about the program. Um, it is in, it's called Opera Seme. It is an Italian opera program where you go down there and you'll study Italian one and Italian two, and then you'll also be able to perform opera scenes and perform in an opera production. Um, it is a $4,200 program, plus the flight is like about twelve to $1,600 to go down there, so I'm trying really hard. <laughs> So uh, in addition to uh, what we're helping her out with, I think you're actually working three jobs, is that correct? And a full-time student, so that's a pretty full plate. So um, we're just gonna try to, uh, when you we're done here as you leave, there'll be a table and there's some biscotti there to uh, give you a little taste of Italy. Um, uh, I thought about last night trying to make some real Italian food and I decided that that might not be good for everyone. Uh, so uh, just some biscotti there for you to pick up, but uh, anything you can give would be greatly appreciated. And in the words of Ryan Seacrest, take it away, Chanel. Hey. which should come the son of God but I do not understand touch my eyes and bid them see that my gaze might pierce the veil and behold in dreams I long beheld Oh, touch my heart and bid it know that every sorrow here is but a moment's tear and thou wilt make me Come of faith and 
I invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward at this time as we prepare the Lord's table together. And as a reminder, you don't need to be a member of this church to take communion. The table is Jesus' table. All are welcome. <clears throat> we take communion here by method of intinction, which means you're going to come forward out of your section, uh, beginning in the front row on the right side, come forward with open hands, receive the wafer, and then you dip it into the cup and then return to your seat. Um, that is how we do this here. If you're not comfortable taking communion in that way at this time, when you come forward, you can take one of the portable communion cups and return to your seat uh, if that's where you are at this stage. So I invite you now to join me <clears throat> in the prayer known as the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing everywhere and always to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so we join our voices with all the company of heaven together as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All glory, honor, and praise be yours, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And together, let us pray the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The table is now open.
Gracious God, we give thanks for this meal in which you have invited us, a way for us to recognize that we are one with you and one with each other. We give thanks for this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> a couple of announcements, um, I think, will be up on the screen. So the Chapel Hill youth are hosting a dignity drive to support um, giving, the basic switch saw, and uh, there's blue barrels outside where you can give the, those small uh, hygiene travel products. If you can gather those together, we're going to collect those through May 24th. Second, um, we have a Chapel Hill family in need of some help. Their cabin was, was hit by the tornado, and so we're going to be helping the Price family to recover that. And so if you are able, contact Marilyn Small for details how you can help. And then finally, um, VBS, not too far away, and we're going to be preparing for that. So beginning this Wednesday and for several Wednesdays from 5.30 to 7.30, uh, we would love your help in preparing for that. So if you can be a part of that, please let us know. Is that right, Ryan? You're nodding. We need help. That's good. All right. Let's stand now for our benediction. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, know this. Your fears and doubts cannot stop God. May the God of love and faith and hope walk with you on your journey, deepening your confidence in Him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.